Hello, friends, and welcome to another video. This week, I'm going to be getting an 18th century makeover at Colonial Williamsburg. Yes, my 10-year-old self's dreams are finally coming true. Now, over the past few years, we've done a few investigations into fashion history on this channel, trying out a number of looks from different decades. Peace and love, peace and love. I'm a beetle. What's that accent? From Liverpool. From the 1980s to the 1890s, learning about everything from Dior's cinched-in new look to the futuristic origins of plastic pants. You feel at home? I found my people. Now, I've been a nerd pretty much my whole life, instilled in me by my parents, math professor Nils and PBS-obsessed Mumtaz, who beyond many, many other things, used to take me and my brother on long road trips around the country to any possible historic fort, museum, battlefield, or animatronic Abe Lincoln within driving distance. Immigrant parents and academic road trips, name a more exhausting duo. And while my dad and brother were more interested in Union Army troop movements, seriously, does every dad go through a Gettysburg phase? I was more of a Liberty's Kids Watching, American Girl Book Reading type. So my favorite spots were the Freedom Trail in Boston, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and Colonial Williamsburg in Williamsburg, Virginia. Which, if you don't know, and if so, fair enough, is an outdoor living history museum that aims to recreate the town of Williamsburg as it appeared in the years leading up to the American Revolution. So 1770s-ish. Reenactors, costumes, and all. And this clearly left a very big impression on me as I still bring it up and reference it in unrelated videos years later. This one smells like the gift shop at Colonial Williamsburg. It smells like the gift shop at Colonial Williamsburg. Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg really had an impression on you. I love it there. And some way, somehow, the information that I was obsessed with Williamsburg reached the ears of Williamsburg itself, and they reached out to us to see if we would want to come by and film a video. And I said, well, Yes. So last October, we decided to fulfill my childhood dreams of getting a head-to-toe 1700s makeover. And to help us on our journey, I recruited Abby Cox and Nicole Rudolph, who are fashion history YouTubers as well as former Colonial Williamsburg employees, who you guys tagged the crap out of in my Instagram shop tab video, to come to Virginia with us, help show us around town, and generally be my 18th century entourage. Now, before we dive in any further, I do want to draw attention to the fact that Colonial Williamsburg does portray a time in American history when the institution of slavery was legal. And though this video in particular is going to focus mostly on the fashion of the 1770s, it's impossible to divorce fashion from the society it comes from, and in this case, the society and economy of the time included owning and enslaving other human beings, not to mention atrocities committed against indigenous nations and what the British Empire was up to in other parts of the world. Colonial Williamsburg as a museum does a lot of work to make sure the realities of the time period are not swept under the rug, with historians who interpret the lived experiences of real free and enslaved black people and exhibits such as the Peyton Randolph House that portray the everyday realities of the people who were enslaved there. I've linked some more of Colonial Williamsburg's resources and research about the topic in the description below, and I encourage you guys to check them out, as well as Cheney McKnight's YouTube channel, not Your Mama's History, which covers the topics of being a Black living historian and dives into the history of free and enslaved African Americans who lived in colonial and revolutionary America. I just think it's important to keep in mind during this video, and frankly, if we decide to investigate any other historical time periods, that though we might be interested in exploring historical fashion trends, that doesn't mean we should ignore the other history that contextualizes those things. But there's a saying in the fashion history community that I'll sort of paraphrase here, you can learn about and appreciate vintage style without idealizing vintage values. And I think that for a lot of living historians, wearing these clothes allows them to better understand the past and the people who lived it. Now, when thinking about my head-to-toe 18th century look, I think we need an outfit, hair, and makeup. And in the past, like with our 1950s makeover, I've kind of gone off and scoured vintage stores to craft my look mostly on my own. But Colonial Williamsburg has hundreds of employees that they dress every day in historical attire. Colonial Williamsburg. 
Here she is, baby. So I figured I'll just let them dress me as if I were a Colonial Williamsburg employee, we'll learn a little bit about the history behind what I'm wearing, and then I can basically strong arm them into letting me do random things around Williamsburg. Deal? Deal. Finally, I've conned Tyler into taking me to Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the last time I was here was 2004. Yeah, I think that's right. Insert general photo of awkward tween Sophia on American history road trip. And upon arriving, <laughs> we circled up with team makeover. Hey, there's a group down there. Yeah, they're waving. <laughs> Are they? And also added Catherine Pittman to our ranks, who is a current employee and historian at CW. And she's in costume today. I am, in case you missed it. <laughs> and our first stop on our journey was the Costume Design Center, where I would be issued some foundational garments for our outfit, a shift or chemise, and a pair of stays, which is the 18th century equivalent of a corset. Definitely Elizabeth Swan vibes. I invoke the right of parlay. <laughs> <laughs> a shift was often made of linen and was worn underneath everything to protect the outer clothes from sweat and body oils. So now what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you take a deep breath and hold it. That's okay. gonna expand your rib cage. And so you will not have the Elizabeth Swan moment. And the stays were meant to provide support, improve posture, and help create the desired silhouette of the period, which was, as everyone has described to me, an ice cream cone. If I'm pulling too tight, please let me know. It's all good. That didn't sound good. No, I'm trying to... Oh, oh my got breath. it, got it, got it, okay. <laughs> Though contrary to the modern idea that corsets were for tight lacing tiny wasp waists on fancy ladies with fainting couches, women of all stations and occupations wore stays, pretty much all day, every day. And though they were structured and boned, they weren't meant to compress the waist, but rather sort of hug it. It's not a weighted blanket, but it is a little, you know? It's supposed to feel like a bear hug. It was kind of interesting for me to note that these items shift stays under petticoat are pretty much the only underwear that an 18th century outfit would include. All right. Great. What do you think? Does it look right? I think it looks right. The stays are the equivalent of the bra, but there are no um, briefs. I guess I'll leave it kind of ambiguous as to whether I decided to wear my own underneath. When I unlace, you're going to feel gravity suddenly take Ooh. hold again. Oh yeah, grab. Oh yeah. It's a weird feeling. <laughs> So after being issued my undergarments, I feel like I'm shedding my skin. We headed into the heart of town to Williamsburg's main drag. In the 1770s, when Virginia was still a British colony, Williamsburg was the capital, with an at the time large diverse population of 2,000 people. And so you could find pretty much anything you would need on good old Duke of Gloucester Street. There are a few of the historic trade shops that CW has recreated that are particularly relevant to our makeover. For the clothes the tailor shop and the millinery and mantua makers shop. The tailor specialized in items that would need to be patterned out, cut, and sewn, including most men's clothes like breeches and jackets and women's stays. Ow! <laughs> yes! It has pockets. Oh, nice. I could put uh, something from the 18th century in there. <laughs> a leg of mutton. <laughs> a leg of mutton? Some cured meats? Yeah. <laughs> the millinery and mantua makers shop was kind of like a two for one punch. The mantua making part dealt with making dresses and women's clothing, though rather than patterning, they would drape and mold the fabric to the customer's body. And the millinery part was basically just selling fashionable accessories to go along with your new fancy dress. Um, in addition, we'll sell you fashionable things to do while wearing the fashionable clothing. The newest of toys and games, musical instruments, sheet music, so that you can be on top of London fashion. With new styles and trends mostly coming over from jolly old England, after a brief four to 12 week trip across the Atlantic, of course. So if this was published in June, by October, we would have this picture in Williamsburg. And Janae and Kate, our milliners and mantua makers, had been expecting us and had actually made a dress for me to wear that it was time to do a fitting in. Wow. So we have a jacket and a matching petticoat. Great. Cue Abby and Nicole speed putting me back into my undergarments. Very NASCAR pit stop of you guys. Locked and yep. loaded. And my mic pack just here. Oh no, it's under your shift, isn't it? Yeah. Can we pull it down more? Yes, actually, there's a lot. 
There's literally, there's a lot. Oh yeah, there was a lot. <laughs> Just keeps coming. <laughs> and then Abby and Nicole putting me into a different set of stays. After Janae decided that I should wear ones that better complemented my outfit. Different stays. Okay, we gotta get you out of the petticoat too. Yep. Great. I will take my mic pack and put it back in between my thighs. Watch out, or I'll lay this microphone like an egg. <laughs> <laughs> now, there were a few different styles of dress that were in in the 1770s. Awesome, thank you. And this style of dress in particular is called a short sack, or a petten layer, which is the shorter version of the more famous robe a la Francaise. And it basically consists of a jacket that's cinched to the waist in the front, but left loose and pleated in the back, hence, sack, a matching skirt, and a stomacher that covers the opening in the front. There's this one. Okay. Or this one. Of which we had actually two different options to choose from. You got the buttons on this one. I think you like the buttons, Tyler. I like the buttons, yeah. yeah. Tyler, likes, <laughs> Tyler likes buttons. In the 1770s, ready-to-wear clothes weren't a thing yet, and every piece of clothing was made custom to the wearer's measurements and taste. So in Tyler's case, only buttons. I say, if you like buttons, we will have to show you some boxes of buttons. <laughs> Don't yeah. threaten me with a good time. But even though certain aspects of the clothing were completely custom, there were really only a few different silhouettes that were popular, with the type of fabric used in the garment being the main signifier of fanciness. The entire female population is going to have this style within their wardrobe. The difference in fabric tells us that maybe it's a party dress versus something the lady blacksmith wears when she's working. <laughs> our dress is made from printed cotton, which could have been expensive, but our outfit in particular is considered fashionable undress. So it's nice but not fancy everyday wear that someone would have worn on daily errands or to work. So we will try on the rest of the ensemble. Now, in contrast to the limited number of silhouettes, there were a lot of literal items that went into your everyday outfit. So shoes, stockings, buckles, ribbons for stockings, shift, under petticoat, um, pocket, maybe hoops, definitely stays, gown petticoat, gown, apron, kerchief, cloak, ruffles, flounces, tuckers, muff mitts, stomachers, etc. Oh, and, and then the hat on top of everything. So, um, is that or is it? <laughs> yeah. So we had a few decisions to make in terms of accessories. So you have the black and the red, very stylish. Very nice. Apparently it was not that big of a deal that your clothing and accessories really matched each other perfectly. Cool. It wasn't really a 1950s Revlon situation. What do you think, Ty? The red's a winner. The red is the classic option. So we basically got to choose whatever we felt like. I kind of like the black hat. Yeah, a little pop of color. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and with our <laughs> etc. secured, we had our outfit. This was your other choice. Oh. It's a little over the top. Vague uh, Toad from Mario vibes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cottage core, yeah. all the way to fungal core. And it was time to move on to the other elements of our makeover, the hair and the makeup. All right. Day two, baby. So the next morning, we woke up bright and early to go to Nicole and Abby's colonial Airbnb to get ready for our day in 18th century garb. I literally came to this corner so you couldn't see me change. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were like kind of trying to stage it. <laughs> go away. Cue the fourth time I'll be seen in my 1770s underwear. Here's my shift. <laughs> She's looking shifty. You got strong Grandpa Joe vibes right now. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. I'll just dive right into bed. Featuring my new pair of stockings and our second set of stays. Okay, it's hair time. It's hair time! It's hair time! Yay! Now, my perception of 18th century hair is definitely tall, powdered, and white, somewhere between George Washington and Marie Antoinette. And though in the 18th century, wigs were a part of men's fashion, per Edith from the wig shop, Women did not wear wigs. Women wore hair attachments. They used false padding, but as of yet, we have no written evidence of women in British North America or the courts of Europe wearing wigs. And their go-to hair care routine was to use pomade and powder. It was a no poo method. Oh. So I've already pomaded and powdered mine. Oh. So you can kind of see what it feels like. Mm. It's sort of like a fluffy, like cotton candy. 
Yeah. Is that it's, weird? <laughs> it's really moldable too. Like it kind of holds shape, but you can smell it. It also doesn't really smell that bad. Oh, it smells kind of good. No, it smells good. Yeah, yeah. It's really not bad even because a lot of people get grossed out because the pomade is made with pork and mud tallow. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that is gross. Yeah. <laughs> so you would start by emulsifying the pomatum in your hands and then kind of coating your hair with it. And you want your hair to have this kind of towel dried, like out of the shower appearance. Mm. So not dripping wet, but you really don't want it to be dry either. Like, oh no, this is actually doing really well. This one that Abby's using on my head is one that she actually made herself with, as she mentioned, mutton tallow, pork lard, and perfumes. In this case, rose and bergamot. You enjoying yourself, Saf? Yeah. I feel like, uh, like a dog at the groomers. Like, eh, no thoughts, just pomade. With the goal of deep conditioning the hair with all them nice oils. Yeah, it looks like I got out of the shower. Oh yeah, oh, like yep. that. Yep. It does look like that. Mm -hmm. Animal fat, because I'm worth it. <laughs> Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's wheat powder. Next, the hair was coated over with wheat starch, both to act as a degreasing agent, but also to mattify it and make it pliable and easy to style. Oh. How you feeling, Saf? Powdered. I'm being very aggressive, I apologize. No, it's all good. It is like uh, Abby is like throwing a Pomeranian against your head. <laughs> you can kind of think of it as a vintage version of leave-in conditioner and dry shampoo. Okay, are you ready to see yourself? Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. How do I look, Abby? You look good. Like, Great. I'm happy with it. Oh. <laughs> It actually wasn't considered medically good for you to wash your hair with water, so people wouldn't really do it unless absolutely necessary. Oh, it's weirdly, it's kind of heavy. Yeah, I grab a hank of it. Oh, do you feel how thick that is? It's really thick. It's kind of heavy, mm -hmm. not wet. Soft though, soft, dry, and heavy. And depending on your social status, you might repowder your hair every day or like once a month. Oh, so like my can... mom. Oh my God, you do. <laughs> Oh my God. Now, the super, super tall hairstyles that I usually think of from this time period did exist, but were worn mostly for fancy occasions by fancy people. Oh, I'm like a troll doll. <laughs> so for a more everyday hairstyle, we decided to just add a little poof in the front using an 18th century equivalent of a bumpet that Abby said was Merkin shaped. A Merkin? A Merkin. A Merkin? A Merkin. Finally! <laughs> After all these years, a merkin. It's a very horned one. <laughs> Let's hope you never actually get your hands on a merkin. <laughs> oh, we can make you one. Yeah, do you want to make one? Yes. We can have craft time. Yeah. My merkin, it's yeah. flown. Get some horse hair, it'll be perfect. And then we put the rest of my hair up in the back so we could tuck it up into my cap. How's it look? Bumpy. Bumpy in the front, party in the back. <laughs> Catch me and Snooky at the Jamestown shore this summer, bitch. Hello. I think I look like a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> now, when it comes to makeup, I once again think of Rococo courtiers in like full face paint. And though that did exist, everyday beauty routines in the 18th century seem to be a bit simpler, consisting of recipes made at home from housewifery or toiletry books, from ingredients you might have bought at the apothecary. Use code King George for 10% oh. off. <laughs> Get out of here. And to achieve the beauty standard of the time, fair, clear skin and rosy cheeks. They describe it as lilies and roses complexion. One would use beauty washes to maintain clear skin, as well as moisturizers like cold creams and face pomatums. In terms of actual makeup products, not much was done to the eyes in this period. There was no eyeshadow, there was no eyeliner, there's no mascara. Burnt cloves could be used to darken the eyebrows if you didn't have naturally dark eyebrows already, but we don't really have that problem. Now do we? Different face powders were also pretty common, but the main cosmetic we're gonna be using is rouge. So the way I like to apply it is just oh, like that. And then, oh. do you see? Yeah. So you can blend as much or as little as you want. There were a lot of different recipes for rouges. That's carmine, right? Right. Yeah. The rouge that we have here, Abby actually made from a brandy and sandalwood based recipe from the 1772 book, Toilet of Flora. Oh, it's running. Okay. Yeah. Go. And then I'm gonna go. Just dab and blend, baby. Oh, I smell the brandy. <laughs> How much do I like? Just go as thing? much as you want. It blends actually really, really nicely. Now, unlike in the Victorian era, wearing makeup wasn't really seen as a bad thing. And so openly wearing stuff like rouge was seen as more normal. 
<laughs> <laughs> slap the face. I feel like I'm used to like a beauty blender, so I'm like slap, 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 slap. All right, I'll rub, I'll rub yeah. more. Variations on lip rouges were also popular, with the goal being kind of like little rosebud lips. Mm. You didn't really get lipstick as much as you got lip gloss. Mm. Quick note, some of the ingredients in these old recipes aren't actually that good for you, so I guess use them at your own risk. I, I consent to the risk. And no, I'm not wearing any other modern makeup on my face here, just to make it as authentic as possible. I don't wanna sound weird, because there is like a grandma vibe, but you look good. <laughs> Listen, if I'm not wearing panties under my dress, I probably shouldn't be wearing foundation under my rouge. Oops, pretend I didn't say that. So with my hair and makeup complete, it was time for us to return to the milliner's shop so we could put the whole look together. I like the hair, Saf. And one thing I have neglected up until now is my shoes, which are these black and mint numbers that Nicole actually made for me by hand. Ty, Nicole literally made these shoes herself. Oh. Isn't that sick? And she has spent quite a bit of time in 18th century shoes herself. You walked 500 miles. Mm -hmm. Would you walk 500 more? <laughs> <laughs> Our shoes here are a pretty lightweight wool on top, with a solid wooden heel underneath. This is really typical. And in fact, the black wool that these are made out of is the most common type of shoe you're going to see in the colonies. So. The uh, carriage force ones. <laughs> Literally, leave. <laughs> and unlike clothing, shoes in the period were actually made in standardized sizes and sold ready to wear. And people are going through three to eight pairs a year. Though interestingly, shoes were made straight last with no right or left foot distinction and would mold to become either a left or right shoe after a little bit of wear. Sweet. Look at them fly kicks. You might find that you have to walk differently today. Oh. In modern day, we're used to heel toe a lot, but you might find it's more of a flat foot. Yeah, you kind of slide. Okay, I think I get it. Yeah, you'll kind of develop something. It will just kind of happen for stability. And with our whole makeover complete. Ready? Boom, hit you with the whole look. It was time to unleash me onto the streets of Williamsburg. I feel like I'm ready to go. Now, right off the bat, with the whole ensemble together, I felt sort of like some kind of villain or assassin. I feel a bit like an 18th century Carmen San Diego. Oh yeah, I see it. With my cape and a low riding hat. Sup? How you doing? This version of the look was a vibe. Tyler doesn't like it though, because it's just like shadow. <laughs> shadow. It's Me. Sultry. Sultry. It's sexy. It's sexy, okay? <laughs> it's sexy. Oh, this is sexy? Okay, got it. But we did try a variety of different accessory combinations throughout the day, with and without the hat and cape. Whoa, it's bright out here. <laughs> Whoa. It's like a whole new world. Yeah. It's like taking off sunglasses. Just to see how it would look. Going back to fancy mode? Yeah, I, I, I was jealous of everyone else's hat. I like how I'm saying this, I can't even see you. <laughs> I think my favorite combination was hat, no cape. What does it look like, Ty? Do you look cute? You look fancy. I, I asked Abby to make it a little less, <laughs> yeah. a little more. I like it. You look really saucy from this angle. Saucy? Yeah. But if these accessories disappear and reappear a couple of times, just don't worry about it. The easiest way to carry it mm -hmm. is you just go ahead, tie it back up, hold shield. it. Cool. Oh yeah. yeah. I have a comeback with your shield or on it. <laughs> This is Sparta! <laughs> now I will say, I did get a kick out of rolling around Williamsburg with my 18th century girl squad. I feel like we're like the plastics. I'm waiting for like a, a dumpster show. <laughs> <laughs> just falls right in. A carry just run you guys over. <laughs> and that's how Regina George died. <laughs> Regina George the <III>. third. <laughs> Regina George the third. Oh my god, leave! It, that's great, I like it. And with all four of us in costume walking around, plus Tyler filming, we did attract a bit of a Attention. Hey ladies, can I take a picture of you? Sure, sure. We kept getting stopped for pictures. Williamsburg Colonial. Thank you very of much. Of course. Yeah. It's the hat. And people reasonably assumed that I worked there and asked me a lot of questions. That guy just asked me if the Playhouse Green was down there, and Nicole was like, Whoa! <laughs> Is it? Is it over there? Okay, so we have not led him astray. Of course, none of which I knew the answer to. Well, he looked right at me, he's like, is the playhouse green down there? I was like, yeah! He didn't just look at you, he came up to you. I like how that was also the worst choice for him, because anyone else would have known the answer, but then he asked me. Yeah, it's kind of like Colonial Williamsburg Roulette. Now, if you are actually a costumed CW employee and you're in the historic part of Williamsburg, there are some rules as to how you're supposed to behave. Yeah, staying character stuff. Good afternoon. Yes. 
You're supposed to avoid using greetings or idioms that wouldn't have existed in the time period. Okay, so I can't say hello. No. And I can't say okay. No, you're not supposed to. And you're not supposed to be holding or using anything that isn't period appropriate, like cell phones or water bottles. There's just like a big eject button somewhere. <laughs> just go flying into the air. When you're off campus, it's okay. Like when we grabbed lunch at the cheese shop nearby. Shall we get a colonial six pack? Or how about some colonial salad dressing? But we had to hide our lunch in our aprons on the way back. My water bottle's in there too. Yeah, we gotta go, we gotta go to the back so no one sees us eating chips. Oh, oh, that's contraband. What are these bizarre contraptions? So crispy, so salty. Now, much earlier, I mentioned perhaps strong-arming CW into letting me do random things around Williamsburg. And I did get some exclusive access to certain places. So now that you're fashionably dressed as a milliner, you can come behind the calendar. Oh, great. And there you go. <laughs> like, I got to pretend to be a millinery shopkeeper. So, your 18th century, when your customers come in, you greet them and you say, what do you buy? What do you buy? What do you buy? What do you buy? A, a few hundred years in the future, I worked at Hollister in high school, <laughs> and we used to say, hey, what's up? Welcome to the pier. <laughs> so, hey, what's up? What do you buy? Now, besides tumbling some wares, do you buy caps? Uh, buy you caps, Tyler? Me? Yes. What else you got? <laughs> I don't know. I did also get to do some hammering in multiple locations. So we have a selection of mallets. Ooh, from. a selection of mallets. Oh, Both at the milliner's shop to create some scallop trim. Just don't smack your fingers. Or your, or your face. Oh. Oh. Oh yeah, this is this is working. This is totally working. I'm cutting this for sure. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> now you just have about 12 to 15 yards to oh. do. And at the leather works to create some buttonholes. Probably good. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep going. It's dead, Jim. That's some good handiwork right there. This is a quality something. <laughs> well. Welt. Yep. Colonial Williamsburg was not super jazzed about the idea of me doing any blacksmithing in my outfit, though, which I guess was fair enough. That's the one thing we have missing, is we need you to smack some smoldering metal. Before everything closed, though, I did find my way to the fabled gift shop to track down its long-lost fragrance. This, I had this as a child. Powder violets. Emphatic pointing. Definitely had this. Which I think after some investigation is this scent. Oh, yep. This could be it. Hi, this could this could easily be it. Can I bring it this way? Yeah, here, I'm gonna, here's the Tyler behind the camera. I've smelled that. Right? Within the last uh, 720 days. There we <laughs> So if you're interested in knowing what the Colonial Williamsburg gift shop smells like, it's powder of violets, people. Yeah, I, think it's I buy it. So with our day in our 18th century outfit coming to a close. No muskets being fired, just Q and A time. <laughs> Fireworks are over. Damn it. it seemed like it was about time to start wrapping up this video. All right, Saf, have you guys um, historically reenacted enough? <laughs> I think we've tired each other out. Oh yeah? I think we've been like, let's walk over there. And then they're over there. <laughs> and then over there. That makes sense to me. You guys had so much energy to start the day. Now, the differences between modern day fashion and 18th century fashion are so massive that it's nearly impossible to compare the two. But it was actually pretty interesting to feel what it would have been like to wear these clothes. And I did actually think that the clothes were reasonably comfortable to wear over a long period of time, especially the stays, which were surprisingly okay. Though I think I might need a little bit more mileage in my shoes before I really figure them out. Just getting outpaced by the stroller. <laughs> Seriously, I literally completely got outpaced by a stroller full of dogs. And I did have to wash my hair like three times before the pomade fully came out. That said, I was very pleased with the amount of colonial catfishing I had achieved. Some people asked me for things today, all of which I did not know the answer to. <laughs> No one asked me where the bathrooms were, which I do know the answer to. Yeah? Right there. Are you looking for the bathroom, sir? Kind of. They're there. They're right here. <laughs> it seems I successfully cosplayed as a CW employee. You could be like the sign guys that spin those signs just, just for bathroom. 18th century sign spinner? Yeah. And after everyone had decided to go home, we did also take our cosplay to Wawa. I am entering the Subaru. Rear first. Oh, all right. All right, you've reached. This is actually hard. <laughs> it looks challenging. Which, to be honest, being the Wawa next to Colonial Williamsburg, I'm sure they were completely unfazed. What do you want? 
Coffee. Coffee. Hot? Yes. So a big thank you to Colonial Williamsburg for inviting me, and a big thank you to Abby and Nicole for being our guides. And in case anyone was worried, I did get to hammer something at the blacksmith the next day. I'm not doing a good job, but it's fun. <laughs> George and the fires at Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> Here is my hook. I am very happy with a thank you. A hook? My hook? My kingdom for a hook. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked that video, make sure to smash that like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to smash that subscribe button. Here are my short form slash social media handles. Here's our live streaming channel. And here's our merch website, in case you want to get yourself a 21st century makeover. And with that, I will see you guys a next time.